Now, now that is the part that we're coming to. It's a Q and A, and some of you have asked questions, and uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, both speakers if you could kindly uh, answer briefly from where you are and I'm going to read out some questions and uh, give us your perspective. It's not necessarily, we're not trying to settle a debate, we're giving our point of view on the question that is asked and, uh, and uh, you know, we're going to briefly, if the question is uh, particularly addressed to one speaker then I'm going to say, otherwise I'm going to let uh, both speakers give their brief point of view once again. Uh, this is not a full-blown speech. Just try to just give the answer. Both speakers, I'm going to request give the answer specific to what's been asked. Uh, this is not going to be. Can you set it to like uh, Martin? Can we set this to like a reasonable time to answer the question? Maybe three, five minutes, maybe. Right? Five. Okay, great. Okay, first question. Uh, this is for both speakers. Uh, I wish to ask how Hinduism and Christianity address the problem of terrorism we're facing all around the world. What's your perspective, explanation, cause, solution, so forth? Uh, Swamiji, you may want, uh, actually, uh, Swamiji, you may want to go first. Whoever's ready. Go ahead. Oh, Pastor. What's the question? Uh, question is. Uh, the, the, asking, the asker of the question wants to know how do Hinduism and Christianity address the problem of terrorism that we're facing all around the world? So how do you address it? What do you think is the cause and what do you think is the solution? According to Christianity, terrorism has no place. Jesus Christ made it very much clear. Even if you are slapped, you need to show the other cheek. And that's what been adopted by uh, even people like Mahatma Gandhi. And Christianity doesn't support terrorism at any level, at any level. And uh, it's, it has no place in the Bible. Bible speaks predominantly love. And uh, if you ask me why there is terrorism in this world, I have to give a biblical answer. The heart of the problem is the heart of the human being. When the human being heart is terrorist, are dreaded, he wants to see violence outside. So unless the heart changes, terrorism cannot change. So as you were saying, yes, I, I think again, this is again according to my view of Hinduism. But if, uh, you know, when terrorism is not something that uh, we put up with, so there is a moral conscience to do the right thing, and we feel it within us. When someone is, Krishna said, when there is adharma, when there is unrighteousness coming, I come again to show you the path. So. It has to be tackled, but as he was saying, the way to change one's actions has to come from inside. So it's because there's some turmoil inside, it's expressing it itself outside. So in Hinduism, I think more the point would be, how do you tackle that internal issue? What is it that's causing the terrorists to, uh, uh, to act in, their, in, in those ways? So yes, you have to take care of the external issue, but also look inside and why is there unrest? These political leaders, their only greatness is how much peace they feel inside. That's what's going to be expressed outside. If you have a political leader who has turmoil and who's feeling, who has a lot of uh, un uh, un unclear, unclarity, that's going to express itself outside. So the first job is to turn inside and clear your own mind, your own heart. This question um, is actually uh, pertaining to Hinduism, uh, to Swamiji. Uh, somebody asked this question, um, why do they worship uh, animals in uh, when humans are superior to animals as per the Creator. I'm sorry, so repeat that again. Why do they worship animals? Uh, why do they worship animals when humans are superior to animals as per the Creator? 
or their create superior created beings. So this is the perspective of the person asking. Yeah. The person who's asking says that <coughs> human beings are superior to animals, so why does a human being have to worship an animal? So my first, but my question would be, what do you mean by worship here? So there may be a presumption there. You can clarify it. You yeah. Know. So well, the asking the person who's asking question is is uh, is asking from the presumptive position where he's thinking human beings worship animals. Right. And Again, this is from my perspective, is that I don't see where we're not worshiping animals. It's not we're not worshiping even objects. You're worshiping the divine consciousness and. Here in Hinduism, they say human beings are the highest manifestation of where that divine consciousness is expressed through. So, so, and but everything has the divine essence to it. But I think there's an incorrect understanding in worshiping animals. You're not worshiping animals. You're worshiping, you could say, the divine consciousness, the divine awareness. Um, it's just like sometimes. Why do we worship different gods and goddesses? Uh, maybe you've heard of that. Let me clear something first of all. We talk there's one divine presence, one divine God. And that God manifests according to our own predisposition. According to our swabhava, our own internal nature, we, we have our own what we call swadharma, our own path. And so that divine presence, God, there's only one God. Let's, whether you call it Jesus, Allah, Krishna. We, 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 um, we go to God according to our own divine, our own nature. So somebody may be, like I said, more active in their nature, self, uh, more, um, in more action. And they tend to serve God in the action. And somebody may be more loving. And they see that same divine consciousness as in the form of, say, Krishna. Or someone may be more meditative, have more introspective mind. And they see that same divine God as Shiva. It's one divine consciousness, just like there's one woman. And according to the different people, we see that woman in a different way. So to a son, they see the woman as a mother. To a husband, they see that same woman as a wife. When the woman goes to work, she's known as a boss. To that woman, when she goes to her mother, she's known as a daughter. So in the same way, there's one divine God. But according to how we approach it, we may approach that God as mother and say, you're the divine mother. I see you as mother to me. Or we may approach God as, I am meditative. I want to meditate on you. I'm as Shiva. One, Shiva represents the divine renunciation and, and contemplation on its own divine self. Or you may see the, that divine is Krishna because you want to express your, your way of connection to God through dance, through love, through devotion. So, so it's, there's one divine awareness, one divine consciousness, but we see it in different ways according to our own nature. But when you get there, you see that it's just the same God manifesting in different ways. But to, add, to, add, to answer that question, I don't understand the question basically of worshiping cows or worshiping over human beings. To me, it's, it's all divine awareness. Can I add okay. something on that? Yes. Because uh, in Hinduism, they have objects of the God. Right. I presume that in our India, people, when they see the object right. as against Christianity, that they have only one Jesus standing on the cross. R right, again, so it's that when you see Krishna in the play of Brindavan yes. with the cows, yes. it's to evoke the a spirit of love within you. Yes. It's seeing that same, that divine presence, God, and saying, God, I want to connect with you. I want to feel your presence here and now. I have experienced this gap, and I need to feel your presence. The thing about, one thing about Hinduism, that's another thing, is experience is much more important than talk. Experience is much more important than faith. You have to experience it. So 
we can talk all we want, which is nice because it, it's helping us to clear our understanding. But again, it's the experience that transforms us. And that's what's most important in Hinduism. So when you see that imagery of God, of, in Krishna, in, with the cow, it's just to pick God as love. And when you see Shiva meditating with the mountains behind, you get this aspect of serenity, the calmness of your mind, the, what we call the vrittis, the mind starts to calm down, and then you feel that peace, that love start to be expressed. And again, all of that is within you. So when I go, the experience is in the proof of the pudding. So when I meet a Swami, like the Swami Shraddhananda, and I'm in his presence, you feel love coming out. It's not conditioned. It's not love that's craving for something. It's love, it's tapping into your infinite source, your infinite divine consciousness, God, and it's pouring out. Okay, thank you, uh, Swamiji. Uh, of course, um, you know, I appreciate you guys asking questions, but uh, uh, by the time you probably by now you figured out we're not going to solve everything today <laughs> so <laughs> good thing that we're asking i have one more question uh, 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 for swamiji then i have one for uh, pastor uh, edward so uh, there are two questions interrelated swamiji one is uh, if we are divine why do we need god and the other one is if everyone is divine who defines morality because everyone's standard of morality could be different what is the real standard? We have laws and rules in this world because there is, there would be chaos otherwise. So, could you explain who defines morality if everyone's divine? Sure. Um, first question was why God, um, who, do, um, what was the first question? What was, I'm sorry, what was the first question again? I, I wrote down the second question, I forgot the first. Okay, the, f the first question is, um, if we are divine, why do we need God? What do we need? Okay. So, yes, good question. And the answer is that, again, we feel limited because of this ignorance, this ignorance that we have, because we are limited. We feel like we're limited beings, and we need to fill that gap. So the only way to truly fill that gap is to turn to God. And it is... When you feel the presence of God in your heart, when you feel the presence of God in yourself, then we feel that that gap is no longer there. And God is the only thing that can eternally remove the gap. That's why we need God. Um, the second question is um, morality. What, what's the standard of morality? So there's a thing, um, what we call the universe, when we talk about the creation here, it's not that we say in Hinduism, not that we say that God is the judge and the punisher, and if you do something wrong, God will punish you. Um, God has set up what we call a divine software in the universe, what's known as Ritam. And it's very simple. If you go with the laws of Ritam, you feel more light, love, peace. We think of it more as it's just a divine software that's running in the universe. Just like if I put my hand in fire, it burns. If I do something wrong, it comes back to me. We call this the law of karma. Every action has an opposite equal reaction. So as you do, as you do more good things, you find within yourself the heart starts to open up. You start to feel more peace joy, understanding. When we eventually look at how divinity at its highest level is expressed, you look at those great souls, the sages and saints who experience God, and when you see their nature, how they act, you notice that they act in accordance to truth. This truth. They act in accordance to like, unconditional love. They act in accordance to feeling one with everything. If you're hurt, they are hurt. If you're sad, they feel sad. Because they connect themselves to that one divine awareness, one divine consciousness. So morality is based on simply that if I do some harm to you, it comes back to me. So why I don't do it is because if I hurt, just like if I hurt my thumb, 
I'm going to feel the pain. There's one awareness, there's one divine consciousness permeating in and through everything. So, if you do harm to another, you feel that harm eventually back to your own self. That's the basis of morality. Thank you, Swamiji. I have one question for um, Pastor Edward. Um, Pastor, you said it's a failed God if he has to come again and again. But God created this whole system in first place. So if he couldn't get it right first time, so he failed, so he had to send his son. Also, there has been tons of suffering even after Jesus came. So he didn't really achieve much, did he? Please explain. God made us with free will because we are the only beings who are having the ability to become divine. We are not divine, but we have the ability to become divine. When God comes into us, we become divine beings. That's what Bible speaks. And that's why the, the, the statement is, there is a God-shaped vacuum in us, God-shaped hole in us. And only when God comes into us, it is complete. Then we become the divine beings. Okay? So that's the purpose of God's creation. Because God has given us freedom, because God has given us free will, we went away from God. We drifted away from God. God is good. Why do I say God is good? When we drift away from God, He did not annihilate us. He did not throw us away. Even before He created us, because He knew that we are going to drift away, He decided to send the Savior into this world. Okay? He decided to... Uh, uh, the, the, he, he planned the path of restoration and that is cross so after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ after the solution has come to humanity why the human beings are not uh, enjoying the uh, ecstasy why the human beings are not living a peaceful life the problem is not with God the problem is with human beings God cannot force anybody into heaven if he does that then we are not human beings we become robots we become animals we are humans eligible to have love, eligible to be creative, eligible to be moral. That means we need freedom. That's why Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. And if anybody listens to my voice, I will come inside. The choice is left to us. And that's the reason Christians preach. The reason for preaching is, Unless people knew that if they don't, if they come to Jesus Christ, they will be saved, they will be destructed. And that's the reason I travel all over the world, to tell the people that if you can come to Jesus Christ, you, <coughs> you can have peace, you can have satisfaction, you can have joy. And not only that, when you die, you have eternal life. But the terrorism in this world, the suffering in this world, it's not because Jesus failed. It's because we did not go to him. I'll give you an example. It's like a story, but you can understand. There was a pastor who went to a saloon for the haircut. The person who was giving the haircut was telling all kinds of stories. Usually, the, the person who gives the haircut, he knows the area of our interest, and he tries to speak to us. He spoke to the pastor and he said, I don't think God is there. I think God is dead. And that's why there is a lot of suffering in this world. That's what the the, the hair cutting fellow said pastor could not give an answer and after the haircut when he paid the bill he went outside he saw on the road a rag picker going with that uh, huge hair which never was washed probably for three four months with all that uh, uh, stingy stingy thing so the pastor called the barber the saloon fellow and said I don't think there are barbers in this city he said why do you are making that statement I don't think there are barbers he said why if there are barbers why that fellow's hair is like that? He said, sir, he's not coming to me. If he comes, I might have done it freely, but he's not coming to me. Then the pastor looked at the barber and said, if you go to Jesus, he will solve your problem. Because you're not going, the problem is existing. That's the reason we preach and tell, if you come to Jesus Christ, your problem will be solved. Thank you, pastor. 
Um, thank God I wasn't walking on that street. Um, so <laughs> it would make a very bad example, right? Uh, I have one more question for Pastor. Uh, this is um, kind of even intrigues some of the Christians. Is like if Jesus is Son of God, then who is God? What does Bible say about the identity of God? See, in U.S., you have strange names. You have people with the name Fox. Am I right? You got it? When I call somebody Fox, I'm not calling an animal. I'm calling a person with the name Fox. Am I right? Son of God is the name. You got my point? It's not the relation. The moment you think about Son of God, you think he is born to somebody. God is somebody who is not born. The essential character of God is eternity. He is neither born nor dead. He is always existing. If Jesus has to be God, he must be there always. Christians believe that God is triune. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And there is a communion between these three. There is a love between these three. There was talking between these three. That's the reason when God made us, he made us with the ability to talk because he is the one who talked. He made us with the ability to love and to be loved because he was having that love. You got my point? So God is triune. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are of the same essence. Same essence. And they were always existing. And they were in one essence. What do you mean by one essence? Now think about India. Indian government is called NDA. Am I right? NDA. NDA is not one party. It has so many parties. BJP, Shiv Shena, Telugu Desam, and all these parties. There are many parties, but one government. There are three persons here, but one Godhead. And that's what the Christians believe. One in essence. Thank you, Pastor. Um